Hello everyone, Adultza Sizda Celestialot Sizda. My ancestral names are Adultza and Celestialot. My English name is Anna. I'm a Swinomish tribal member and I'm coming to you from the Swinomish land and Smeush Beach. And today I will be talking about the moon of the silver salmon. Much of this moon takes place during September and during this moon, silver salmon, also called coho salmon, are fished. The other salmon runs continue in the bays and rivers. Large quantities of salmon are smoked and dried to be stored for winter use. Late summer berries reach their peak ripeness and are harvested during this moon. These fruits are mashed, dried, and used for pemmican. During this moon and the one before, seeds used for trading and storing for next year's planting are collected. A traditional diet is dependent upon resources that are seasonally available, making preservation of these foods very important. Seed saving and the role seed saving played in a traditional economic system were important in the past and is still practiced today. Some of the seeds that are harvestable during this time include nettle seed, and these pair very well with lavender. It helps offset the energy that nettle seed does give you. Nettle seed is also known as nature's Red Bull. A couple other fruits and berries that are harvestable during this time include rosehip, and rosehips can be dried and infused in honey. You can make them into a jam, and you can also enjoy them as tea. And another fruit that is harvestable is our friend crabapple. And crabapple can be canned or dried for winter use. Other preservation methods will now be demonstrated by Jordan Johnston in filleting salmon and Regina and Gale with soapberry. My name is Jordan Johnston. I'm here at Northwest Indian College at the Swinomish Reservation uh, during the moon of the silver salmon. Uh, today we're going to show you how to fillet salmon, how to can salmon, and if we have some fish eggs, we'll uh, make some ikira, which is just salmon caviar. Uh, very easy process to do. So first, you're gonna cut right here, right behind the pectoral fin, uh, probably about a 30 degree angle, I would say. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. And right here, you can see we have some salmon eggs. So we're just gonna be really gentle, cutting open her belly. Obviously, you don't want to damage anything. Nice. And here, you can see, perfect, <laughs> gorgeous salmon eggs. And then, just cut the egg sac. There is some beautiful salmon roe. <laughs> and then after getting it, I am gonna need to wash the fish. Try not to damage any of the meat that's in there. Make an insert about two inches away. And you'll feel the backbone of the animal. Uh, that'll be your cue to twist your knife, curve it. And look, you'll be able to see the backbone here. Just follow it through with your knife. Yeah. Canning it, you're gonna wanna cut them into about inch and a half, two inches, I would say. So the process of canning is uh, once you put the salmon Inside the jar, you add a little bit of salt, a little bit of oil, um, and seal it, and then you can put it right into your canner. So you're gonna want it all the way up to 10. That's the pressure you're gonna want it for, at 10 for 90 minutes, and then you are good to go. That's canning. So right now, we have our beautiful salmon eggs, uh, our salmon roe. So right now we're gonna be washing them thoroughly with water uh, just to get rid of any bacteria. So we have a jug of warm water and that'll help separate the eggs from the embryo. It just makes it easier to pull apart. 
So do a quick dip. You don't want to do it for too long because the eggs will, they'll start cooking. So after you get all of them off the embryo, you salt them, salt them for 15 minutes in the fridge, take them out, uh, rinse them, uh, salt again, and then you're gonna leave those in there for another 45 minutes. And then after that 45 minutes, they should be good to go. The sisters Gail and Regina are First Nations from Canada, and their word for soapberry is husham, but in Lashut Seed, our word for soapberry is swasib. My name is Regina Zabatel, and I am from Canada. I am from a little town called Squiloch, and that's Pavilion, BC, and I'm gonna Talk about Husham, Soapberry. My name is Gail Kayu. My Indian name is Lakwia. And I come to make juice out of the Husham. Husham is a little orange, sometimes red berry that grows on little bushes. And it helps with the stomach. And it has the uh, vitamins in it and everything that pretty well everything that the body needs. We pick them in June, July, and August, we can pick them, depending on what level of ground and that you're on. And we pick it, we wash it, and we cook it, and then we take and we use, I use a pillowcase, a cotton pillowcase, and we squeeze it. We squeeze all the juice out of them and then we reboil. Some people put sugar in theirs when they make it. I like mine without the sugar. You have to have a grease-free bowl and a grease-free thingamabarber here. Every time you make it, it's never, you, you can't really measure because everything is just by by how you want it or who makes the husham. And then you add a little water and then you beat. Yeah, I, I really believe if, if everybody were to go back to live like we did 50 years ago, they lived like we grew up. There'd be lots of healthy people around. The people knew what the medicines, medicines looked like and what to do with them. And they taught the children. And nowadays, kids don't even know everything's a weed to them. It just made like Kool-Aid, but it's, it's made out of soap berries. But this has peach in it and it won't make ice cream because it's mixed, I have some with strawberry and some with peach. It's to help your stomach stay. Kokwalku was generations back, she was the chief's daughter and she was the most beautiful woman in, in the village and loved to sing every day. She would always go to the water and she would sing her songs and you know help gather the seafoods and whatnot. And, and uh, this aroused the spirit of the water. And every day he would come out, he would listen to her sing, tell her how beautiful she was, and tell her how he loved to hear her sing. And, you know, he kept doing that every day, and then he'd come out farther out of, farther and farther out of the water. And then pretty soon he was, you know, standing next to her and telling her how much he loved her and wanted to marry her. And, you know, Kualaku knowing that, that if she agreed to do this, that she would have to leave her people, said, I don't know if I can do that. And besides, you have to ask my my father, the chief, for, for my hand. And so the spirit of the water came out in, in full body form. Had seaweed, had barnacles on his, on his body and everything. You, you can see it was part of the water, but he walked into the village and he asked the, asked the chief for Kokwalaku's hand, hand in marriage and just angered the chief. 
said, no, you, my, being my only daughter, I can't let you have marry her because I know you'll take her away from me. And, and so the spirit of the water also got angry and, and, and left. And when he left, he said he was going to take the seafood, seafoods with him, the, the shrimp, the fish, the, the salmon, whatever else that we would gather out of the water. He took that with him. I don't know how much time went by. But I know our, our elders were getting weak from not getting food, and our kids were were also not growing properly, not getting nutrition. And so this saddened the maiden, Kokwalaku, and she went to her father and asked if she could marry the, the spirit of the water and, and uh, do this for her people so that we can bring back the seafoods. And, and the chief reluctantly agreed, but he also asked that she come back and visit every year and so they did that that she, she got married and she went to the water and every year she came back it, it was obvious that the water was taking over her her who she was you know she couldn't speak she couldn't she had she had the barnacles and the seaweed all over her, and so the last time she came, the chief told her not to come back because he wanted to remember her as she was. Another thing we were told, um, you, know, you can see her in the water if you look down and you see the seaweed flowing in the water. You can that's that's the spirit of Kokwala who you know showing herself to us. And, Letting, in, letting us know that she's still protecting us and still taking care of her people, but doing what she did. I just wanted, to, I just wanted to thank the salmon. It was a sacrifice that we got from. It, from somewhere, a creator out there that gave us all this abundance of nature. We have fish, we have crab, we have clams, we have oysters. We have a lot of resources out here. And when you respect it and give it time and give it life, it will flourish and it will give back to you. This fish has given us meat, it's given us eggs, it's given us a learning experience and it's given us more life and a way to cherish it and respect it. We're going to give it back to where it came from and say thanks.